Welcome everybody to the 2022 Young Investigator Award Symposium. My name is Gabriele Villarini and I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Iowa and I'm the chair for this award. ISNAF is the Italian Scientist and Scholars in North America Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to connect, empower and celebrate the Italian intellectual diaspora in North America, connecting more than 3000 scholars, researchers and technologists in North America. ISNAF has a number of awards to celebrate the excellence of Italian researchers in North America, with a particular emphasis on early career Italian researchers in recognition of their significant and innovative contributions to their field of study. Today, we are here for the Embassy of Italy Award. It is in its third edition, and it is a thematic award. This year edition recognizes a fundamental contribution to agriculture, food quality, and security, with the broader goals of reducing poverty, fighting climate change, and improving human health. It is sponsored by the Embassy of Italy in North America, and I take this chance to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Condorelli and Dr. Ciorba, who are science counselors at the, uh, the Embassy of Italy. Here with me, I have two members of the jury who helped uh, with the selection of the finalists, Professor Paola Pastalacqua from the University of Texas at Austin, and Professor Marta Tuninetti from the Polytechnic of Tur di Torino. The three finalists will present the research and we will then open it up for questions at the end of each presentation. If the audience has any questions, please put them in the Zoom chat. Uh, without further ado, we will start with the first finalist, Dr. Salvatore Calabrese from Texas A&M University. The title of his application is Holistic Natural Resources Management for Climate Smart Agriculture. Okay, can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks uh, ISNAF and thanks the, the chair and the jury for the opportunity to share what our research group, um, the work of our research group on uh, natural resources management in the context of climate smart agriculture. I am an assistant professor at Texas a and University since 2020 and our group started in February, um, shortly after I completed my PhD at Princeton University. So in this talk, if I can make it work. So in this talk, after a brief introduction to climate smart agriculture and its challenges, I want to present the, how we are advancing soil models to, to expl explicitly represent the soil microbiome and how we are using these models to develop adaptation and mitigation strategies in the face of climate change. So climate smart agriculture is really a global effort to transform the agricultural systems from policy to management mm -hmm. and from, from multiple scales, from the individual farm to the global scale. And there are three key objectives, uh, which include sustainably increased productivity and incomes of all producers, small and large, adapt to climate change, climate variability and build resilience, as well as mitigate climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing soil carbon sequestration. As an example, uh, in the US, the USDA recently invested $2.8 billion in partnerships for climate smart commodities, of which Texas and m here received 65 million for a project led by our colleagues in soil and crop sciences to, um, to, um, uh, to deploy climate smart practices throughout Texas. But from a scientific perspective, climate smart agriculture adds new dimensions to agricultural management because not only now we want to increase productivity and limit the use of resources, but we also want to specifically address climate objectives. We want to increase sequestration. We want to reduce emissions. So we have to develop new strategies. The challenge is that agricultural systems are very complex biophysical and socioeconomic systems. And new strategies, they need to account for the wide range of interactions between biological components like plants, animals, soil microbial communities, as well as abiotic components like climate, the soil, physical properties, and the broader socioeconomic system. <clears throat> and and the new, new strategies to be effective, they need to adopt holistic approaches that account for this. So in our group, 
We embrace this complexity. We recognize that this is a transdisciplinary effort and we are trying to bring in microbiology, biochemistry, hydrology, thermodynamics, and we use tools from mathematical modeling and statistics to leverage the increasingly available data, for example, from remote sensing or distributed sens sensors to truly to find simplicity out of this complexity. We look for emerging dynamics and emerging behaviors that we can leverage to find and develop, cl and develop climate solutions. So to simplify our approach in uh, three points, um, we begin with theory-driven data analysis. And what I mean by that is that we analyze the response of soil, a soil process to a change in environmental condition. But we are not only looking for correlations, we want to ground our results on theories. Then we want to use this understanding to develop or advance process-based modeling. These are typically dynamical system models that account for the interactions between various components of the agricultural systems. But our goal is then to use this knowledge and these tools as a decision support tools so that we can develop new strategies, we can inform strategies and provide recommendations on, on for example, irrigation or other soil management options, not only, again, to increase productivity, but also to specifically address climate objectives. The limitation with current trad or traditional decision support tools is that they do not account for soil, the soil microbiome. And that's critical because the soil microbes are actually those key actors that regulate soil carbon storage, greenhouse gas emissions. So we need new models, a new generation of soil models that they can explicitly account for the soil microbiome. And that's what our group has been focusing on from the soil micro site to the ecosystem scale. The reason why traditional tools don't explicitly account for that is that because it's difficult. If we look at a micro site uh, in a small soil sample, we quickly realize how heterogeneous it can be in terms of a variety of niches with different uh, water conditions, temperature conditions, substrate conditions, and all of that gives rise to an incredible biodiversity in terms of microbial species and metabolisms. And if we consider how many bacteria are in soils and how many different species, we, it seems almost impossible to address questions like how fast do microbes grow and how efficiently. So we need new approaches to try to really answer these questions. And in our group, we are adopting a thermodynamic perspective here. And so we looked at the, we are looking at the, uh, the growth reaction, the anabolic reactions of bacteria. This is just an example. And if we look at the energetics, we quickly realize that this is energetically is an unfeasible process. It's like asking a ball to spontaneously climb uphill. We know by experience that that's not going to happen unless we have engines that burn fuel and push the ball uphill. But that's what microbes do. They have catabolic reactions where they use, they oxidize some of the substrate that they assimilate to produce energy and transfer it to the anabolic reaction for growth. And this is very reminiscent of how thermodynamic engines work. So we were able to use um, a thermodynamic framework for non-equilibrium processes to explicitly derive the thermodynamic efficiency for microbial growth. And we could use this framework to analyze available data on microbial growth. That's an example of theory-driven data analysis that I was mentioning. And when we analyze how the thermodynamic efficiency can change depending under various conditions, what we saw, something actually may be expected, especially if you are savvy with thermodynamics, is that the faster the microbial engine, the faster they process food, the, um, the lower the thermodynamic efficiency. So, the faster the engine runs, the more energy it dissipates. And while this can be expected, what the interesting finding here is that the decay of the thermodynamic efficiency follows a power law. And power laws are often found in non-equilibrium phenomena as a sign of organization. So there may be some order in this complexity. The second important conclusion here is that the, the pattern is, is consistent regardless of the macro, specific metro, me, microbial species or metabolic pathway. 
that was a very interesting result, which we published last year uh, in PNAS. But we, we look at various scales. So we also look at microbial activity, specifically microbial respiration, which is CO2 emissions at the ecosystem scale. And what we found here is, again, something very interesting is that the variability in CO2 emissions from soils is mostly controlled by the variability in the soil water content as well as the vegetation, vegetation productivity, because vegetation provides the primary input of, of carbon to, to soil microbes. So as shown here, if we, if we know the probability density function of soil water content, we can, and, and we know vegetation productivity of that ecosystem at the ecosystem level, then we can predict the probability density function of microbial respiration. So that was an, another interesting result because it shows that the ecosystem level for some ecosystems, especially those that are stationary, all of that complexity may reduce to just two axes, wetness and vegetation productivity. But then we try to use this knowledge that we, 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 we gain from data analysis to advance soil models. And in this specific example, this diagram shows the kind of interactions we are trying to establish between carbon cycle, water cycle, and soil physics, soil physical properties. And the soil physics aspect is something that is particularly novel in, in our group. And it's very important for climate smart agriculture because in, in general, in agricultural systems, changes in management or mechanical disturbances, they can all alter the soil physical structure pretty rapidly. So we need models that can account for how the, these properties can change and the effect that they have also on the carbon cycle and on the hydrology. So we are trying to establish these linkages. And while we are trying to advance fundamentals, I've shown in this first part of the presentation, we also want to make an impact. And so we use our, our um, mathematical modeling skills to, to develop strategies for adaptation and mitigation. In terms of adaptation, um, one important concern is, the, is with the increasing frequency and intensity of droughts. And that's very important for agriculture, considering that 80% of the cropland area globally is, is not irrigated. But we have conservation practices that can help with that. This practice that I show here in this, in this photo is called soil mulching. It consists in covering the soil surface with a, with a layer of for example, crop residues from the pre previous season. And the common belief is that by covering the soil, we can limit evaporation and therefore more water for your crop. But it's not that simple because this layer sometimes may actually intercept all rainfall event, can retain water and can quickly, and then water can evaporate from this layer and the soil may never see that water. So what we did, we went back to the fundamentals of mass transfer and evaporation to develop a, a parsimonious model for soil mulching and how mulching affects the agricultural system. We were very um, happy with our results as shown here, but, but the important aspect of this work is that we could, we could estimate depending on, your, on the climate, depending on the soil type, depending on the crop, we can estimate if there is an ideal mulching thickness or mulching amount uh, that can bring beneficial effects on your crop, in specifically on transpiration. Only in that... Okay, great. Only in that case, we can delay the impact of droughts. And in a case study that we analyzed, we are talking about delaying the effect of droughts by 15 to 20 days. So it can be very substantial, but only if you design mulching properly. And we know that some collaborators at USDA are uh, interested in, in this work, which we published uh, early this year. And now we are thinking of mapping um, science, this science-based recommendation by US County to inform um, agricultural extension specialists or consultants. We are also concerned with the increasing uh, concentration of methane in the atmosphere. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, and agriculture contributes to that. Uh, for example, rice fields, they contribute at up to 10% of global methane emissions. That's because 
uh, rice is grown under flooded condition, as I'm showing here. And flooded conditions create anoxic conditions in the soil. And that favors the production of methane. That can be seen from these measurements throughout the growing season, where methane emissions start rising when, when after we flood the field, they reach a peak in the middle of the season, and then they decay towards the end of the season. And so we want to keep producing rice because it's a staple crop, staple food, and we want we need to produce rice to keep this high production, but we need to reduce methane emissions. Um, there is a common practice to reduce emissions, which is to drain the field sometime in the middle of the season. If you drain the field because you bring oxygen back, then you abruptly uh, reduce emissions as, as shown in these measurements. And but, but the question is, depending on your climate, depending on your field and your soil type, when is the best timing to drain your field? So we can use models, and that's what we did. We, we, we use the fact that there is a consistent pattern in the uh, time evolution of methane emissions to develop a simple model and find if the, indeed there is an optimal timing for draining the field. And we use this model to analyze um, to analyze rice fields globally, although most of them are in Asia, the ones that we analyzed. And if we look the, the graph here in blue, we can see that the pattern is very consistent of methane emissions with, during the growing season. And we could find that there is an optimal timing for draining and farmers are not using that optimal timing. And But if we use the optimal timing, we can reduce 35% on average of methane emissions. In addition to that, some farmers now are switching to organic amendments as a form of fertil fertilizers in place of chemical fertilizers to reduce nitrous oxide emissions, which is another greenhouse gas. Now, the, the problem with that is that it considerably changes the pattern of methane emissions because now you have much more emissions at the beginning of the season. But that is okay because if you have models like the ones that we developed, we can find the optimal timing for these fields. And in this case, we found that on average, we can reduce methane emissions by 45%. So in this case, with organic amendments and optimal drainage timing, you can hit two rocks with the same stone because you can reduce methane and nitrous oxide emissions at the same time. And so I hope I conveyed in this short talk, I conveyed the message that the field of natural resources uh, and agriculture has plenty of complex problems. And if any of you uh, in the audience enjoy working with complex problems, we need more people contributing to this field. Uh, it's a truly a transdisciplinary effort, which we need more transdisciplinary collaborations here, especially to help think outside of the box. Again, with the goal of finding that simplicity out of the complexity. And uh, a remark that I want to make is that it is extremely important to advance the fundamentals alongside data-driven techniques. And that's because even if we have a lot of data now and the availability of data is increasing, that's still probably negligible when you compare it to the large number of degrees of freedom that you need to describe the complexity in agriculture. So it's very important to be able to rely on theories. And uh, we also work on other projects uh, related to negative emission technologies like enhanced weathering. We work on soil and ecosystem restoration. We work on biosphere thermodynamics, and if you're curious, you're welcome to visit our website. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, our research group, um, Achla and Nikila, our PhD students, and postdocs Rodolfo and Hang. Of course, this is their work, and I'm just presenting it. And I would like to thank uh, our sponsors for, for their support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, for the presentation. Uh, what I'll do now is I will open uh, open it up to the open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, as I mentioned, if anybody um, uh, has any questions, uh, please put them any of the attendees, please put your questions in the uh, Zoom chat. And I can ask one if you want me to start. Please, Paola, thank you. So thank you very much. It was a, a very good presentation, Salvatore. And admittedly, I don't think about soil microbiome very often. 
And so what I was thinking about as you were talking about adaptation and um, kind of like that makes me think about, of course, future climate scenarios. What do we know about how the soil microbiome itself is going to change under future climate? Is that a concern? It is pretty much a concern. And we are, that we are actually working on that. We are trying to develop models that we can eventually we want to advance current air system models so that we can actually see how that's going to change. Um, we have some projects, some are, also, some are pending exactly to explore that. For example, mm. uh, with global warming, how is that going to impact the soil microbiome? The expectation is that, um, is that we can see shifts in the microbial species that are present in soil. And that means that we can see changes in in the growth rate overall at the soil level, we can ch see changes in, in, um, in, in CO2 emissions. And, um, you know, we have many experiments that look at that, but the problem is that in these experiments, warming is applied suddenly. Like at some point, uh, the soil is warmed up by four degrees Celsius. And so in that case, of course, we see a large, uh, jump in situ emissions for the first year or two, and then we see a slowdown in emissions. But whether that is applicable to the global warming that we are experiencing in the real world, that that we don't know, because it's much more, it's, it's slower, and it, it takes time to see it. Yeah. Marta. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Salvatore, for uh, the nice talk. I appreciated it. And I have a question about, about the um, methane emissions. Um, it was very interesting for me. I was wondering uh, if you tried uh, yeah, here in this figure, uh, so the first chart, uh, um, I mean, the dot point, the shape, remind me the uh, basically temporal evolution of the crop coefficient curve along the growing season. So uh, I was wondering if you try also to relate uh, the emission to the uh, evolution of the crop itself. That's actually what our model does. Uh, okay. One reason why we, there is a peak here is because of that. It's because of how the plant is contributing um, to the emissions. In this case, rice contributes in two ways. Uh, one is because that's probably the peak of photosynthesis activity there. And, and that's when they release a lot of um, easily degradable substrate through the roots, root exudates, and that feeds microbes for producing methane emissions. So that's, account, that's exactly what we account for. Mm -hmm. And the other reason why we have this peak, and that also depends on, on the plant, is because um, rice, um, they provide a conduit to, to methane transport. So the, the methane flows through the rice directly to the atmosphere, essentially bypassing diffusion um, from, you know, through the soil and the water table. So very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Salvatore, I have a, a quick question, a couple of quick ones. One on this one. Uh, can you tell us something about the yield of these fields, depending on when you do the draining? It, um, the, it, one of the things to convince farmers, I guess, that that's uh, important is not just the domain reduction, but also the yield from uh, for the fields. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, if you have looked into that? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Yes, we have looked into that. Indeed, our our um, our paper here includes a brief analysis on that. Um, so one one reason for draining. The field mid season. This is a very this is an old practice. It's also um, because it it helps the yield. So actually, draining in the middle of the season, providing that uh, jump in oxygen, can help the development of the plant. So that's why they were doing it, and and they do it uh, as I was saying sometimes in the middle of the season. Um, but as I mentioned later, that's probably where it becomes more relevant. Depending on how you're managing the field, you might have to shift that drainage, drainage timing substantially from the middle of the season. And so that's where we, we try to look for data on, on the impact of the drainage timing 
on the yields. Unfortunately, there is not much available. We were very surprised. And the reason is that probably no one has ever thought about this. Like how, you know, if I change the rainless timing by five to 10 days, but you need to have the same field, right? Same conditions, same growing season. So you need a multi-plot experiments to really analyze that. But the few data that we have suggest that mid-season is when you have the uh, you have the that benefit for growth. So, yeah, when you when you switch here, if you reduce the and you reduce the yield or you risk to reduce the yield, you need to provide provide incentives. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Okay. And Salvatore, we are uh, uh, the time is uh, the time is up. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for answering. Uh, uh, for answering our question. Much appreciated. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Uh, the, the second finalist is Dr. Christian Casella uh, from Northeastern University. The title of his application is Boosting the Cold Chain Efficiency Through Printable and Batteryless Subharmonic Tags. Uh, Christian, please take it, uh, take it from here. Yes, can you guys see my screen? Now we can, yes. All right, very well. Let me just uh, take. Uh... All right, sounds good. So I'm Christian Cassella. I'm assistant professor in the electrical and computer engineering department at Northeastern University in Boston. And I'm also the director of the microsystems radio frequency laboratory there. I'm very happy to be here today uh, to discuss about one of my recent research trust aiming at boosting the cold chain efficiency through printable uh, and battery-less subharmonic tags. So um, the inability to timely and remotely identify the items that undergo temperature violation uh, every year cause the huge amounts of food uh, wastages that are worth more than $50 million, billion dollars only in the United States. If you consider USA, Europe, and Canada, uh, this uh, amount goes up to 400 billion. It's also estimated that 40% of the food, uh, the food produced in the world has to be uh, disposed due to the inability to keep it under proper refrigeration conditions. And of course, this undermines all the efforts uh, that we keep uh, doing, uh, aiming at producing more food to increase the wealth and the safety of our global population. But this is not only about uh, economic loss, it's also about uh, the safety of our food consumers, because it turns out the inability to, um, uh, to, ide uh, to identify timely and reliably items that are being thermally uh, spoiled every year cause uh, football illnesses uh, that lead to 120,000 hospitalization and 3,000 deaths just in the United States. So one would wonder uh, how come uh, in a period of time where we are li literally living under uh, many different types of uh, wireless revolutions and technology revolutions, we still are unable to timely and reliably uh, detect uh, temperature violations of items that are stored or distributed along the cold chain. Well, the answer is rooted directly into the limitations of all the wireless sensing technologies that, are, uh, that have been proposed in the past. So it turns out there is no, even, there is no one single technology that allows to achieve uh, high enough reading ranges to be used in the long and uh, large warehouses like those that are used by the cold chain industry that can be printed on, on low cost and disposable substrate without requiring expensive integrated circuits or without requiring batteries, which are not eco-friendly, uh, which can identify temperature violation for any times along the cold chain, uh, meaning all the different times with, uh, with a broad set of heterogeneous characteristics that can operate at the deep frozen temperature, which are conditions under which components like batteries stop operating. And at the same time, can memorize the occurrence of temperature violations without really requiring memory devices. And this is particularly important to prevent items that have been thermally spoiled from being distributed and sold, threatening the safety of our food consumers. So in other words, uh, it is really important now uh, to, in order to boost the efficiency of our cold chain uh, to, imp to generate a new type of remote sensing technologies that can be mass produced inexpensively and uh, in an eco-friendly way, and that can be somehow reprogrammed to monitor any refrigerated items that are distributed, stored, and sold along the cold chain. 
And among the different technologies that are uh, available uh, today, uh, it is, passive tags are definitely um, the most promising one due to the fact that they can be manufactured at extremely uh, low cost, uh, 0.01 cents per tag is the target for this sort of systems. And uh, at the un on the other end, they also require zero required maintenance after the, um, um, after the deploy deployment. Nevertheless, the reading range and the accuracy of this kind of tags is certainly not adequate for the, for the critical um, the targets of, coal, of the cold chain industry. And the reason why um, such a limitation occurs is rooted into the operation of the current sensing systems that rely on passive tags for temperature sensing. So these systems um, use the strength of the backspattered response signal that is generated from the interrogation signals by the passive tags as the readout parameter to, to extract the information about the temperature on the passive tag. So the problem with this uh, sort of uh, method is that the interrogation signal and the back scatter response signal have the same frequency. And uh, as a result, um, they, it's very hard for the readers uh, used by the current sensing systems to distinguish the signal coming from the tags uh, from, the, from, the, from the copies of the interrogation signals that instead are generated from process of interferences. Like, for instance, uh, from the electromagnetic echoes that are originated when the interrogation signals interact with the electromagnetic environments, or from processes of reader self-interferences where a part of the interrogation signal leaks into the receiver of the readers. So in this regard, uh, my research over the last few years has followed a completely different approach in the, with the scope of achieving passive tags that could overcome all the limitations of the commercially available ones, even uh, enabling a, a much richer set of functionalities and, uh, and also much longer reading ranges. So I developed a, a new class of uh, passive tags, which I named subharmonic tags, which have the uh, inherent capability of responding to any interrogation signal with a, with a signal that has half the frequency of the uh, interrogation signals one. Meaning that now, since the signals that the back, that the, there is backscattered from subharmonic tags as half of the interrogation frequency ones can be easily distinguished from it, as well as from any other interference signals that are originated from the interaction of the interrogation, uh, the interrogation signals with the environment. But on the other end, subharmonic tags also uh, exploit uh, quite unique nonlinear dynamics that have been the first one unveiling in electromagnetic devices. And in this regards, uh, they use these nonlinear dynamics to boost the sensitivity uh, with respect to temperature variation uh, by orders of magnitude, as a matter of fact. And you can see here a plot showing how the output power that is backscattered from a subharmonic tax changes dramatically as you start changing the temperature um, of the sensor that embodies them. And this means that even the smallest temperature change can be detected through subharmonic tags. On the other hand, the same dynamics allows to build the subharmonic tags over uh, as, with much smaller, uh, with much small form factor. Uh, and you can see here a picture of a subharmonic tax that uh, we built in my lab, um, which is um, which has an area of 1.3 centimeter square, which is even smaller than a fingernail. Uh, there is also other advantages that, that, that originates from the oper unique operation of these tags. Uh, so first of all, uh, the, the fact that uh, the subharmonic response signal uh, has, a has a half the frequency of the uh, conventional passive tags backscatter signals makes them able to, uh, to undergo a four times lower attenuation due to the electromagnetic propagation in the medium. And this means that uh, four times larger reading ranges are possible by using in subharmonic tax with respect to conventional passive tax. And these numbers go even higher if you uh, compare the operation of subharmonic tax and passive tax in actual indoor or underground settings, which are frequent in, um, which are frequent in uh, cold chain facilities. But the most interesting uh, feature that these tags have, which is the real reason why uh, we are very excited about their use for cold chain uh, temperature sensing is the fact that they can be designed as wireless alarm temperature sensors. So in this scenario, subharmonic tags are able to produce a backscattered output signal only when the temperature is exceeded a remotely configurable threshold value that is indicated as TTH. And not only that, when, operate, when designed to operate as wireless alarm temperature sensor, 
and as, uh, as soon as the, the alarm gets triggered, subharmonic taxa have the ability to keep their signal up, so it keeps the alarm up, even if the temperature returns to a tolerable temperature range. So what this implies then is that with these technologies, we cannot only save food by timely identifying uh, temperature irregularities and taking actions uh, to prevent the uh, items from being spoiled. But we can also make sure that the thermal, to mark permanently all those thermally spoiled items that would otherwise be erroneously distributed and sold to the food consumer, threatening their safety. I validated the first subharmonic tax we built uh, for cold chain temperature sensing uh, uh, in the, along the fourth floor of the interdisciplinary science and engineering complex at uh, Northeastern University, which is uh, which houses around uh, 20 research faculties offices, uh, around uh, 40 research labs and 150 PhD students. And there is a map uh, just to show you the size of the uh, of the area where we of the uncontrolled area where we actually tested our device. And what we uh, excitedly found uh, is that we were able to detect temperature violation of a refrigerated item pretty much along the entire floor of the building with a maximum reading range of around 56 meters, which is only limited by the actual size of the building, as a matter of fact. And this, this size, this reading range, is a, a world record for passive types. Five minutes. All right. Yeah. Excitingly, we also verified that the, sub the subharmonic tax uh, assured by controlling their interrogation frequency a remotely reconfigurable threshold value from minus 50 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, which means that with one single tag, we can now monitor uh, temperature violation affecting the entire spectrum of items that are sold and distributed along the cold chain. And this, in my opinion, is, uh, uh, is, is very, very uh, important to mention, since uh, the ability to have one single item to control every single needs across the, the cold chain permits to build an economy of scale out of it. On the other end, we also verified that the, the subharmonic that the built the device could actually retain the information that a certain temperature violation had occurred. And, uh, and you, what you can see here is how the alarm, if, if once triggered, remained up, even if the temperature all of a sudden would return into a tolerable range, 20 degrees farther away from the threshold that they activated the alarm in the first place. Which means, means that the, with this uh, dynamics that we were the first one to exploit, so Barmonic Tax can implement a memory functionalities without requiring any batteries, any memory components, but only with through printable and disposable components. So to conclude, uh, I've introduced subharmonic tax, which have been invented in my labs, and I've presented their main operational features for cold temp temperature sensing. I also showed a uh, case, the very first subharmonic tax we built, um, which showed uh, that it has the potential to overcome all the limitations that, that have prevented the achievement of a passive tax technology for this sort of uh, application framework. We are very excited about these technologies. We are trying to pursue it also on a commercial scale, and because we are really, um, we are we really think that this could that could be provide the means to reduce the huge amount of food wastage um, in our society, as well as to lower the current rates of specialization and death due to food uh, illnesses. Uh, I want to thank my uh, the sponsors of my research, which are uh, the National Science Foundation, DARPA, and a couple of companies, Rogers Corporation and Checkpoint, and of course all my students uh, working in the lab. Um, and I will be very happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Even though we have been doing Zoom for the past several years, uh, still remembering to unmute is part of the learning process. Christian, <laughs> thank you very much for the uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll open the floor to for questions. I see Marta uh, raise their hand. Marta, please take it. From here. Yes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Christian, for the nice presentation. I have a curiosity. Yes. Uh, did you have the chance to uh, to make some scenarios to estimate uh, uh, how big uh, would it be the reduction of food waste uh, thanks to efficient cold chain? So it's a, it's definitely an interesting uh, uh, questions, and uh, that I mean to to be honest with you, the, to answer that kind of questions, you only you need more than uh, the physical device that implement the sensing. You need to think about the actual infrastructure that will keep monitoring the 
uh, the devices in the uh, in background, right? So, I mean, there are um, the several things that can be done to use this technology in the most valuable and efficient ways. And I think uh, there has been work um, they're trying to use uh, uh, to learn by artificial intelligence, um, as well as uh, deep learning, uh, how to manage passive tags in the most uh, accurate ways. Uh, what was missing so far was the ability to do what this can do on the physical layer. So the type of signal processing that allows you to passively detect some violations. How do you effectively use them in actual uh, cold chain facilities? It will definitely and certainly depend on the type of facilities that we are talking about. And there are so many different types of, uh, along the entire cold chain. If you think about production, distributions, and um, and and of course the um, uh, the, the final um, uh, retailers that also manage those kind of products. Um, so. A full estimation of how much you can improve, it's hard to make. But what I can tell you is that um, regardless of the advances of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, brain-like uh, computations and systems that can actually do uh, process tons of different data nowadays, uh, I think what was really missing is the uh, actual uh, eye or ear, if you wish, that allowed to detect these informations and do uh, what needs to be done to trigger the actions to uh, to fix a certain product and to make sure that uh, no more food uh, spoilage uh, occurs. So I hope this answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Paula. Thanks, Christian. That was very interesting. Uh, I have two very basic questions. <laughs> yes. One course. is, what is the cost of this technology? And And also the other question that I have is, can you provide an example of an implementation? Like, you know, I can't imagine how many do you need? How do you place them in a production facility, for example? Uh, yes, so the, the good things about this technology is that they can be very small. They don't require any integrated circuits. So the, the target for uh, passive tags is in the order of one cent per tag. This was valid for barcode. For remote sensing uh, uh, devices, generally the, the, there is a reasonable target is around 20 to 30 cents. And these devices are very, very small. So this actually uh, helps uh, reducing those, uh, those costs uh, significantly. And on the other end, they can be built on printable and flexible substrate as well, because, uh, because of the fact that they don't, they don't incorporate any fancy integrated circuit device or memory components. So you need to think of that um, it's hard to beat the cost of these technologies with respect to any other passive tag implementation that has been done uh, out there. Um, so the way to use them, uh, again, um, we, so far we have showed that we can, that we can in, a, in a single room, we can detect the temperature violations uh, of items, uh, reconfigure the threshold of the such items so that, you know, different elements in the, in the cold chain will have different thresholds. So we can discriminate between data streams coming from, this from these elements and recognize when every single element goes under a temperature violation. We can do that, but in order to really scale to the actual uh, um, scenario, and this is something that we are trying to pursue at the moment, uh, um, we need to actually test them in, in an actual cold chain uh, facilities. So, so far, we, what we have done is testing in these research labs, which gives you some confidence that the operation can actually work. And, that, and, uh, and of course, the preliminary data is very encouraging. Uh, but to give you a full answer for that, uh, I, I mean, we are trying to pursue a collaborations with, uh, with a cold chain uh, retainer. And we are, we'll try, we'll trying to, uh, to, to test these technologies uh, further and, and to, to try to, to get those kind of data that you need. Uh, and this is uh, actually something that we are doing in the process as we are uh, setting up our own uh, startup about this technology. Christian, I have a quick question for you. Yes. Um, and uh, I guess it follows on pa Paola's uh, question is, uh, you mentioned that your technology is uh, hard to beat in a sense compared to active or other kind of uh, systems. Uh, yes. Can you tell me what the policies are? So I, you know, uh, do the manufacturer have to have ways of monitoring uh, uh, these uh, temperature changes? Are they required? Because if they are not, uh, in a sense, um, you know, you could have a technology that then uh, doesn't have a market if they are, uh, can you tell, uh, it's a world I know nothing about. Can you tell us more about what the policies and requirements are for uh, for that? 
you mean policies for uh, uh, from the point of view of the food pro- of the food producer FDA, of, the, of the distributor yeah. FDA? So, yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm actually able to answer that question so that at at the moment because it's it's something that we are just starting to to pursue. Mm-hmm. I mean, our discussion with the uh, I mean, from what we understand from the food producers and uh, from the retailer that we talk to, uh, I mean, they want to create a case that this actually is, uh, has, helps their uh, their case in reducing the uh, uh, the uh, the loss uh, in their case uh, uh, economic mainly. Um, but, but with regards to a more general FDA policy, this is something that I haven't really specifically looked at because I'm I mean I, from my side are mostly in, in contact with the entities with some entities that want to validate the ideas. I haven't really went through the uh, to the next step, which is uh, uh, you know how to apply this idea in a in a conformal way with what the regulations ask, which is something that I assume the 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 retailers and as well as the different entities I'm in contact with uh, will uh, um, will consider. Uh, I mean, it's, an, it's a very interesting question, but I mean, being on the physical layer side of the problem, so being someone that is sort of provides a, techno, a, a technology for, to tackle a certain problem, um, we, we tend to focus mainly on the technological side of the problem. And, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, based on the inputs of what our, uh, um, you know, the, the targets that we have uh, are. And, and this is something that, uh, um, so in other words, I, uh, we specifically talk with the with uh, with the entities we are in contact with with regards to these technologies, and and they gave us some requirement in terms of applications. But I don't have a clear um, uh, view of what happens uh, above uh, that level. So how it, those companies will comply with the regulation that FDA wants uh, about these items. And I mean, I, and on the other end, I mean, let me also say that this cold chain. Um, um, this cold, cold chain inefficiency is something that has been uh, uh, going on for different, different types of applications, as we all uh, are very aware. I mean, this is something that can be extended to other markets as well, not necessarily the, uh, the food market. And um, But again, from, from our side, being a two years old technology, this is something that we are at the moment only uh, trying to, um, to work with the entities directly. We haven't really specifically looked at uh, the uh, FDA regulation because it's something that we will figure out once we create the actual case that this actually works in an actual environment. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. I, oh, my pleasure. Uh, thank you. It's uh, time to move on to the third presenter. The third finalist is Dr. Lorenzo Rosa from the Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford University. The title of his application is uh, Sustainable Irrigation ensuring food security under climate change through adaptation. Uh, Lorenzo, please take it from here. Can you see the screen? Uh, we see the, not the full, uh, full, uh, full screen. Yes, now we can. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Lorenzo Rosa. I'm a principal investigator in the Department of uh, Global Ecology at uh, Carnegie Institution for Science, and I'm an assistant professor by courtesy at uh, Stanford University. And uh, today I want to present uh, some work uh, we have done on sustainable irrigation and the role of irrigation to ensure food security and adapt agriculture to climate change. Population growth and rising incomes, as well as an increase in per, in per capita food consumption, are expected to increase global food demand by 50% by mid-century. And satisfying global demand for food without causing additional climate change and additional environmental degradation is a central challenge of the 21st century. There are two approaches to meet uh, this increasing food demand. One is to, in- to expand agriculture, so is agricultural extensification. And agricultural extensification consists in expanding the cultivated area and is a practice that is uh, often considered unacceptable because of damages to biodiversity and carbon emissions. And the recent examples of agricultural extensification are the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil for cattle production and soybean production, 
or the deforestation of the Borneo uh, rainforest in Indonesia for oil palm plantations. The other approach to increase food production is agricultural intensification. And agricultural intensification consists in increasing crop productivity over currently underperforming cropland. And the intensification consists in adopting modern technology, modern technologies to bring water through irrigation and nutrients through fertilizers. Indeed, the water and nutrients are the two main limiting factors affecting agricultural productivity worldwide. And many scientists advocate for agricultural intensification because it avoids the negative impacts of extensification. Uh, sorry. However, uh, agricultural intensification has also negative impacts, such as unsustainable use of water resources and water scarcity creation, use of fossil fuels to uh, run machineries, pump irrigation, and produce fertilizers, and uh, water pollution. Therefore, there is a need for a sustainable intensification of agriculture. And uh, water is a major factor affecting global food production worldwide. In fact, as we can see in the map, two thirds of global croplands are constrained by rainfall. So the, the areas in green show, shows croplands that are rainwater limited. So there is not enough water from rainfall to meet crop water demand. And this phenomenon is defined as green water scarcity, while the croplands in gray are not rainwater limited. So there is enough water from the rainfall regime to meet the crop water demand. And over centuries, humanity has provided supplemental beneficial water to uh, croplands facing green water scarcity. And in the map, we see the extent of irrigated cropplands today in blue. And the irrigated lands correspond to 20% of global cropplands. They provide a reliable supply of water to crops and, ma and make production resilient to climate. Irrigated cropplands have uh, higher yields than rain-fed agriculture. In fact, while only 20% of cropplands are irrigated, 40% of global food production is from irrigated land. However, irrigation uses about 90% of global water use by humanity and is the largest driver of water scarcity. And we define uh, that irrigation practices create blue water scarcity when Irrigation water consumption is greater than local renewable water availability. And uh, when uh, this uh, condition is verified, irrigation practices are defined as unsustainable. And examples of unsustainable irrigation are groundwater depletion, as we can see here, uh, the, we see in the figure the Central Valley Aquifer in uh, California, which is uh, strongly depleted because of uh, irrigation. And the other example of unsustainable irrigation is environmental flows depletion, meaning that not enough water is left in rivers, lakes, and aquifer to preserve aquatic ecosystems. And in the figure, we see, for example, the Colorado River Delta that for several months per year does not reach the ocean because of strong uh, withdrawals for irrigation. And uh, using uh, hydrological models, uh, I quantified the extent of uh, unsustainable and sustainable irrigation worldwide at high, at high spatial resolution. And uh, in the figure, we see in pink regions where there is unsustainable irrigation, that are the Central Valley in California, the High Plains in the US, South Spain, uh, China, Pakistan, and uh, India, for example. And uh, I find that half of irrigation practices are unsustainable because they are depleting groundwater stocks and environmental flows. And I quantified that 1.3 billion people are reliant on food that is produced from unsustainable irrigation. So this has very important food security implication should uh, this unsustainable water uh, disappear. An important remaining question is if there is enough water to expand irrigation over 
rainwater limited croplands. In fact, as we see in the map, in green, there are croplands that are facing rainwater scarcity, so the rainfall regime is not enough to meet the crop water demand. And these croplands are not irrigated. So here, crop productivity is water limited. And uh, in some croplands, there are available water resources in rivers, lakes, and aquifers. But irrigation is not in place because of socioeconomic and institutional barriers. And uh, we define this concept as agricultural economic water scarcity. And uh, using uh, hydrological models and earth system models, uh, we mapped uh, at high resolution the extent of uh, agricultural economic water scarcity worldwide. And uh, in pink, we see these regions where uh, uh, croplands are rain fed today. They are uh, rainwater limited, so the rainfall regime is not enough to meet crop water demand. But uh, there is enough water locally available in rivers, lakes, and aquifers for irrigation expansion, but the irrigation infrastructure is not in place for socioeconomic and institutional barriers. And uh, these regions are mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, and Russia. And uh, they cover 35% of uh, uh, agricultural lands. And by expanding irrigation in a sustainable way over these croplands, I quantified that it would be possible to increase agricultural productivity and food and feed 1.4 billion additional people. However, agricultural interventions adopted under current climate conditions are going to be ineffective under future warming. And some important questions are how agricultural water scarcity will change under global warming, and how can we adapt agriculture to water scarcity with better water management? To do this using climate models, we quantified the extent of green water scarcity under glo global warming. And in green, we see the croplands that are facing today green water scarcity. So there is not enough uh, rainfall to meet the crop water demand. In yellow and pink, we see croplands that will face green water scarcity in a 1.5 and 3 degrees warming climate where 1.5 warming represents the Paris Agreement climate target, while three degrees warming is the global warming that is expected to be reached by the end of the century under current policies. And as we can see, these areas in, in pink and, uh, uh, and in yellow are going to expand substantially under climate change. And uh, in fact, uh, an additional 90 million hectares of rain-fed croplands will be affected by green water scarcity. So this will affect food production, reduce agricultural productivity for an estimated 1.45 billion people. We then quantified the solutions that could be adopted to reduce green water scarcity under global warming. And these solutions mainly increase infiltration of water in the soil and reduce evaporation. And they are shown here in the figures, some of these uh, solutions that are terracing, rainwater harvesting, pitting, mulching, and agrivoltaics. And uh, we find that uh, the adoption of these solutions can reduce green water scarcity over 50 million hectares of rain-fed croplands, and uh, therefore avert food production for an equivalent food production loss for an equivalent of 0.67 billion people. However, the solution will not be enough to offset projected full loss under global warming because of increased green water scarcity. Five minutes. Therefore, irrigation is an important adaptation strategy to climate change because it can provide water and reduce water stress to crops, but at the same time can, can also have the beneficial effect to reduce heat stress through the cooling effect of evapotranspiration. And using climate models, I quantified the extent to where irrigation will be able to be expanded sustainably under global warming. And we see this region in, in the map in green, in the northeastern US, in Brazil, sub-Saharan Africa, and eastern Europe. And uh, under global warming, we find that, that the potential we, uh, will be uh, similar to the potential that we have under current climate condition of about 1.4 billion people that can be fed with sustainable irrigation expansion. 
However, there will be an increased intra-annual variability in water resources that will require more water storage to store water from the wet season to the dry season. And uh, as highlighted with the green arrows, we see that uh, in, under climate change, we will need long-term water storage to feed an additional 340 million people that and, under current climate condition were not needed. So in, in this figure, I want to summarize uh, the effect of uh, water scarcity and food security under global warming. And in the first bar in the left, we see that the current cro croplands today feed about 8 billion people of which 2.1 billion people are fed from sustainable irrigation. 1.3 billion people are fed from unsustainable irrigation, which deplete groundwater stocks and environmental flows. And in green and yellow, we see the number of people fed from rain-fed croplands uh, that are facing green water scarcity, 0.89 billion people, and that are not rainwater limited. Uh, croplands that are 3.9 billion people. Under global warming, in this case in a three degrees warmer climate, we see that over irrigated lands we will lose food production for uh, an estimated uh, 0.49 billion people because of lack of water for irrigation. An additional uh, production loss for an equivalent of 1.45 billion people uh, will happen because of uh, increased green water scarcity. So there will not be enough rainfall to meet the crop water demand over rain-fed croplands. We then quantified the potential of solutions to increase and offset the, the effects of water scarcity under warming. And we find that uh, green water management solution can offset uh, food production loss for an equivalent of 0.67 billion people. And uh, uh, irrigation expansion, sustainable irrigation expansion over croplands facing economic water scarcity can feed an additional 1.4 billion people. So some key messages that I would like to leave are that water is a limiting factor affecting two thirds of global croplands and irrigation expansion is uh, an important adaptation strategy to meet uh, future food security goals. The concept of agricultural economic water scarcity allows to identify where land and water are available for a sustainable intensification of agriculture. And importantly, agricultural interventions adopted under current climate are going to be ineffective under future warming. And in particular, investment in water storage will, will grow more important to preserve future food security. And this is my last slide. And um, you see me in the picture assessing uh, green water scarcity in a wheat field in, uh, in Volterra in, in Italy and uh, doing some uh, sustainable irrigation in, uh, in the vegetable garden of, of my family in my hometown. And uh, I acknowledge my co-author in these studies and I thank you for, uh, for uh, your attention and I leave the remaining time for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh... Well, let's open it up for, uh, for questions. Marta. Thanks, Lorenzo, for the nice talk. Um, I have a question about uh, green water scarcity. Uh, how did you define it? Maybe I miss it. And uh, what was the temporal resolution of uh, this indicator? Thank you. Yes. So green water scarcity is defined as the ratio between blue water demand of a crop, so the supplemental additional water needed by a crop, divided by the total crop water demand of a crop. And uh, is the, we, we, green water scarcity is verified when you don't have enough water to meet the crop water demand. And, and you can use different ratios. And in this study, we, in this slide, I just show the result with uh, 20% less crop water demand, but uh, in the study we tested the sensitivity of our results considering minus 10%, minus 20%, minus 30%, etc. And, uh, and, and we showed the yield response to different uh, green water scarcity uh, scenarios. And the other question was, sorry, uh, the temporary uh, solution, yes. Yeah. The, the temporary solution, so we did it at monthly time step because uh, climate models uh, are constrained with monthly uh, time step in terms of uh, runoff. 
and uh, in terms of uh, blue, uh, blue water availability, runoff, and uh, evapotranspiration. So we use uh, climate, different climate models from uh, like NASA, NOAA, all these uh, groups, uh, and uh, we quantified different projected temperature, precipitation, all the climate uh, variables to quantify um, water availability and demand from crops. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, Paola. Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. That was, that was really interesting. So I was looking at the global maps um, and that got me to think about, I don't know if this is a question or this is a comment or just a badly formulated question, but it got me to think about shared water resources between countries, right? And so you start thinking about rivers that are actually shared between countries. And so I was looking, for example, India, because I work a lot in Bangladesh, and India was all in the blue water scarcity, right? And in fact, there is a project ongoing, which is the interlinking project that essentially plans to divert a lot of the water uh, from, from the Ganges upstream of Bangladesh, essentially, and getting a bunch of that water actually before that. So I guess my, my poorly framed question or, or comment is, um, how do you reconcile this, this work and recommendations with the decisions that the countries will take and how do we as scientists get to, you know, kind of like influence to the extent that is possible those decisions? Yeah, this is a great question. So you are mentioning the water transfer projects. No? For example, even here in California, we have uh, transport of water from North California to LA area, South California, that is thousands, uh, uh, is a river that uh, artificial river that bring water north to south. No? We have in China, big project, there are projects under construction in, in India. So in these models, we use biophysical models and we account for water available within the basin. For, in some cases, we account for these big projects like California, China, so these projects under construction. But obviously there are so many projects under, undergoing that when you do these studies at global scale, you inform like the great picture, then you, you have to go locally and do like local case studies. And uh, about the policy real world applications. So like this work has been published in the past few years, but they have been uh, already contacted by a lot of organization like FAO, the World Bank, and they are really implementing uh, the results. Of, of this research. For example, they have a, a multi-million project in uh, Nigeria to expand irrigation uh, using uh, solar pumps, especially. They are, pro they are studying uh, how to expand irrigation in Ukraine after the, the war. So they have a big project as a, uh, as a reconstruction plan to expand irrigation in Ukraine because they will have a lot of green water scarcity in Ukraine. And they say that the one way to solve it is irrigation. And indeed they are using like my green water scarcity and my blue water scarcity assessment to, to convince uh, um, decision maker to, to put big money in that and invest irrigation. And uh, the first part of the project has been recently approved. So they are uh, working on that. And they say they are doing similarly, FAO is working on irrigation expansion in uh, Georgia, the country, not the state in the US. Uh, so I think is making uh, some impact to this research and is applied. Obviously, then you have to go locally. Once you have, like, you see that you have big potential in this region, you have to go locally and consider all the social, economic, and infrastructural uh, factors. But uh, let's say the, this concept of economic water scarcity is very powerful because it tells you where. There is the land and the water to do it, to do irrigation expansion, but there is no irrigation. So you, you have to go there locally and you know that uh, obviously something is missing from the social, economic or institutional point of view to bring uh, irrigation to increase agricultural productivity. Thank you, Lorenzo. I, I just have a couple of quick questions and I think again that they back on what Paula, what Paula mentioned. Uh, one is, uh, you, you mentioned the storing water, which in a sense is building dams, right? And uh, in a reality where, at least from a US perspective, where there is a push towards actually removing dams rather than building more, the big phase in the 40s and 50s up to the 60s of building them, that phase is uh, transitioned out and now there is more of a push towards removing them. So I was trying to 
think about what uh, yes. how to reconcile this. And the other aspect is from a groundwater utilization. And many of the policies and the doctrines in place, uh, at least in the US, uh, is are such that there is a little uh, uh, legal uh, um, oversight as far as uh, utilization of uh, groundwater. And so I was trying to uh, think about how you, I wouldn't know how to incorporate this in what you mentioned. And so I'm trying to pick your brain as far as uh, how you would go at it and how you did it. Yeah, so it. The, for, to answer your first question, so water storage is uh, with uh, dams, with larger reservoirs. So you have surface reservoir. Or you can do water storage with managed aquifer recharge, rainwater harvesting, small check dams, okay? It's not necessarily with big uh, dams. And uh, we have a study in press in PNS, it will be published in the next few weeks. And basically we assessed how much uh, storage we have from large dams to, to do this irrigation expansion. And I, I was not able to present it here only in 15 minutes. And uh, basically we find that even if we use uh, the water that can be used for irrigation from these dams, from dams that are available today or the dams that are going to be built in the future because they are building a lot of dams, not in the US, in Europe, but in other countries, they are building a lot of dams. We can only meet half of the water storage that will be needed to meet this irrigation expansion. So the main conclusion of the paper is that we will need additional and alternative water storage options like manage aquifer recharge. I think managed aquifer recharge is, is very important because you reduce even evaporation. Or from dams, you have a lot, or a lot of evaporations, while when you are in an aquifer, you have other issues, but you don't have water losses for evaporation. So this is to answer your first question very quickly. The second question was about uh, um, policies about groundwater, right? So I guess these policies change a lot by country. So in the US, uh, I know from my uh, other work on oil and gas extraction that uh, you own the land, but you don't own what is below your land, uh, depending on the state. So I think uh, like this is very important, uh, like about groundwater extraction and, and especially about avert groundwater depletion. So withdrawing too much water when the uh, amount of water replenish with, with the hydrological cycle. And this is all policy, you know, is the next step of my research. But yes, it's an important point that should be considered when you do this irrigation expansion and when you take these decisions. Perfect. Thank you, Lorenzo. And uh, the time is up. I would like to uh, thank the finalists for uh, all their uh, hard work. Oh, Christian, sorry. I, I see you have a... I'm sorry, I don't know how my hands. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, no worries. So, sorry about that. No worries. No, thank you all for the wonderful presentations and for sharing all your hard work. It has been very enlightening. And uh, uh, we, this conversation, hopefully, it's something we can also take when we'll meet in person in uh, DC. Uh, I want uh, the awardee of this award will be announced uh, at the ISNAF annual meeting on November 7th. And before uh, com uh, finishing this meeting, I would like to ask Dr. Chorba for some uh, final uh, final remark. Oh, can I, I guess you can hear me, but not see me. Correct. Okay, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> at this point, I can be Dr. Ciorba, but actually, I'm Giussi Condorelli. <laughs> so Perfect, thank you. I to be Dr. Ciorba is my colleague. Okay. So join us. So... You should see me now. Not no. yet. I'm, yeah. Yes. Oh, good morning. Good. Um, <laughs> nice to meet you. Happy to see you and be 
seen. Okay, so just a quick, I'm Giussi Condorelli. I'm the science counselor for health at the Embassy of Italy, uh, who is really, really pleased to be the sponsor of this uh, award, supporting uh, young investigators in, in the big picture science uh, itself. So first, uh, let me offer congratulations on the topic, which is, uh, as we know, is uh, crucial nowadays for the collaboration between Italy and US, but more broadly in a global meaning. So to testify, to testify how crucial it is, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, has recently posted a dedicated professional to the embassy, Dr. Beatrice Ciorba, who is uh, online right now and is following, and uh, who is filling the position of agri-food attaché. Ciao, ciao, Beatrice. So furthermore, let me congratulate the three talented investigators who presented such interesting research today. They are already winners, all of them. So Salvatore, Cristian and Lorenzo, I wish you good luck for today and in general for your careers. And I look forward to meet you, to meet you in person on November 7 uh, at the embassy for the easy. just uh, said everything. I don't have anything else to add. Uh, just wish you all a uh, very good luck for your future. I was really interested in all your presentation. I mean, um, and, you know, in this topic is so, in, so very important for us and for our future. So um, I wish you can, you know, proceed on your studies and uh, let us know how the things will, will go in the future. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. So with this, we are gonna conclude this uh, conclude this event. Uh, thank you to all the uh, panelists, the jury, the finalists, uh, and uh, Isna uh, for uh, for this event. And I look forward to seeing everybody in uh, uh, at the embassy on November seventh. So thank you all, and have a thank wonderful you. rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Nice Bye. to meet you all. Bye. Bye.